Uh, well, next up is uh, Phil Edholm uh, to discuss the NMRA local clubs and divisions, the place where you can probably find a mentor that can work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Phil, welcome. Jim, thank you. Welcome to Model Railroading. And as much fun as Model Railroading already is, there is one way you can make it even more fun and get even more out of it. And that's by becoming a member of the National Model Railroad Association, the world's largest model railroading organization. The NMRA is devoted to the development, promotion, and enjoyment of the hobby. In fact, the NMRA has been setting industry standards for model railroading for over 80 years. From standardizing track gauges and coupler heights in the early days, right up to defining the specifications for today's digital layout command control systems, the NMRA has always been at the forefront of advances in the hobby, establishing conformity and compatibility among model railroading products. Not many other hobbies can say that. The NMRA has 18 worldwide regions, which include North America, Australia and New Zealand, Britain, and Europe. These regions have annual conventions where modelers can swap ideas, tour prototypical industries and railroads, see model railroad layouts built by other members, and get to know fellow modelers from a wide geographical area. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome our, our guest today, which is Philip Taylor. Um, Philip, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me. You're more than welcome. So today, and as part of our, uh, our segment on clubs and divisions, we're going to have just a, a quick conversation about kind of how clubs and divisions, local organizations are engaging with modelers. Um, you know, what's interesting is a lot of the national things tend to kind of blur away unless you go to a national convention. Um, unfortunately, this year, I'm not going to go. I decided post-COVID, I, after having gotten it, I don't want to expose myself again. So... Other than that, it's really all about local uh, local groups. So, so tell us a little bit about you know your uh, local roles, divisions, and clubs, and kind of how you're involved. All right. Well, I'm a superintendent of the James River Division, starting on my ninth year as superintendent. Uh, the irony of today's meeting is that Raymond Whitmer, who you mentioned, happens to live in the same community I do. There's about <laughs> twelve thousand people in uh, Palmyra, Virginia. So I'll, I'll get him in touch with the local N scale group. Um, we don't have a club actually with a layout, but I actually have a club um, that's kind of regional in area. There's actually two of them in this division. So our activities are we have uh, meetings every other month uh, in person, and then we have a meeting every other month um, in between those live me uh, in-person meetings. We have Zoom chats, which we started back when COVID, and people have enjoyed them so much that we still keep them there. We still have members who um, our, region our division is rather large. We're pretty much everything east of the Blue Ridge, south of uh, the D.C. area, northern Virginia. And how, many member, how many members do you have? About 100 only. 100. Um, but um, what I've been told by, we have uh, two hobby shops, um, train-oriented one. One's a Lionel one, and the other one carries pretty much everything from N or Z, actually, um, all the way up through uh, Gardens Railway. And what I've been able to gather from talking to the hobby shop owners and the guys who used to own some of the others, I think we probably have less than 10% of the modelers in our, in our area uh, as members of the division. So uh, we do get folks who float in and out, and we have a growth of uh, retirees. This is a retirement area. People moving out of um, New York, particularly in the D.C. area, um, move uh, hit our area because it's kind of the first area south, and it's still close enough to Washington to drive in, particularly for military retirees, they can hit the PXs up in DC or out on the, uh, on the coast, but uh, the housing, you can get out in the country and your housing costs drop substantially from the Northeast. So, uh, but you're still close enough to family and you can still make a day's drive up into that area to visit kids or grandkids. Um, so we try to encourage things. We've started, um, we've been pushing the master model railroader program quite a bit. That's one of my, one of my first things I started pushing. Not for bragging rights. That's that's a mis uh, misunderstanding. I think 
for so many people outside the NMRA or even NMRA members. It's not meant there to, to say, hey, I'm an MMR and uh, I'm better than everybody else. It's, it's for kind of pushing yourself to educate yourself on different aspects of the hobby. Most people have something they love to do. I have members who hate to do track work and guys who love to do track work. But it, it forces you to learn at least how to do track work. And it's make you a well-rounded modeler. So we started doing that, and we've got a great chairman of that. We also have a publication that we put out six times a year uh, called Cross Ties, which is on our website, which is jrdnmra.com. Um, and if you look for Cross Ties, you can download just about every back issue for the last several years. So we have a uh, modeling theme that we do every other month for the live meetings. People bring models. They can show them off, talk about them. Um, we try to have at least two clinics, and we try to have at least two open houses. Um, we always like to try to tie our open houses in with um, with the clinics. We've had one on layout, layout command control a couple months ago, and the guy had his afterwards had his layout open, where you could actually go see his implementation of it, and understand how things worked, and ask him questions, and actually put your hands on it. Uh, we've done the same with signaling also. That uh, seems to be a growth area lately. People have a lot of interest. Um, upcoming, we'll have um, our next uh, meeting will be at the local hobby shop. where We have a good relationship with the, the fellow. He builds layouts for uh, people um, and he's going to open up his workshop to us and the division will uh, will ask for donations because this one's a little more expensive than our normal run, but we're going to, everybody's going to build about a couple inch square, probably four to six inch square um, piece of scenery on a um, base with a small pond and a tree and uh, everybody's going to learn how to do scenery is something to that and we try to do that annually uh, weathering scenery something that everybody can get in get around tables work together uh, understand and learn how to do something to further their hobby so um, but you know it a lot of this takes as Jim was saying volunteers um, I'm blessed to have a couple uh, really good volunteers my um, editor who's also my um, AP chair um, really puts a lot out we've got a retired um, a man who did uh, for one of the local universities was their head of publications so his skill set is phenomenal he is the one who does behind he doesn't want to do the editing doesn't want to interface with people he just wants to do, be the technical specialist and I'm happy to do that I've got um, some re a soon-to-be retired army uh, officer who's been helping me out and picking up our social media and a lot of things I just put out the word and I let people know we need somebody to do X and I'll do a certain amount of it. And then I kind of, when they see their need, somebody usually steps forward. I have members who helped other members uh, dispose of estates. Um, we do try to take care of the, the widows of our um, members because they, um, how do I want to put it? We've had some gentlemen who've had several hundred banker boxes full of models in their basement. And the wife goes down and looks at it after the husband passed away unexpectedly and just didn't know what to do. So we kind of try to come in, help them at least get something out of us, a reasonably fair return on all that capital that's sitting there and distribute it out. We've had one member who's been very generous who built, they're now sitting in my basement. We're going to try to get, uh, do them. He's um, has health issues and he's now passing on his craftsman built kits that are built to members. So we try to find them good homes. Um, and there's a lot of clubs that we try to maintain a good relationship. Um, as you were saying, Raymond's looking for an N-scale group. There is, an, there is a G-Track club. And there's one of the members happens to live here. It spans the southern half of our division. And then there's another T-Track division a group over in Richmond, uh, which is also in our division. So you'll have a couple different choices um, of where he wants to go. We try to sponsor it. In fact, uh, though I am primarily interested in S-scale and um, – S scale is kind of an odd scale, uh, particularly like the narrow gauge end of it, which goes back to the um, my roots. But um, and there have been two new manufacturers who started an S scale in the last week, I think. So that's really says something. Um, but you know, we try to get things other. We've got a we've had an O and thirty modular group, and that kind of went up for a while and kind of uh, phased out as some of the members passed on who were involved and. Now we've got an HON3 group that was starting just as COVID hit and that um, uh, the hobby shop owner who's been kind of coordinating all that has told me that people are interested in starting that up again. So we'll try to support that, get that going, try to, you know, all scales are good. It's, you know, each scale has its blessings and its uh, curses, so to speak, you know, benefits and things that, 
you know, will help. O scale is uh, been a pad. I was in that for quite a while. I really do like the, the heft and the size, but um, getting ready to build my moved into my what I call my retirement home when I hopefully retire in about four or five years. Um, I'm hoping that we can um, the layout will come. Uh, just had the basement uh, worked on a little bit, and I think it's almost ready to start work on it. So, um, I think I've been calling pretty straight. What else, Phil? Phil, do you want? Yeah, me to so, talk I, about? so I guess the question. So you do it you, once a year. You kind of do a hands-on activity mm -hmm. at a clinic. Um, are there other things you do that are hands-on, and kind of what other things do you see as ways to kind of encourage that personal contact and mentoring? You know, where you do have. I, I like the idea of having a clinic followed by a visit to the uh, clinician's layout to see how they use the, that skill on their layout. That's actually a great idea. Um, but are there other ways you kind of encourage people to make those contacts? Uh, we've had um, discussion sessions. We had recently did a, what we called a joint build project. Uh, we bought the division bought and gave to members a, uh, we are able to, at a good price, come in a large cache of undecorated uh, Acurel boxcars. And we encourage members, um, COVID did put some real wrinkles in trying to get this project off the ground. Um, but it did allow us to, everybody to kind of build it. Most of the members did actually build what they were given. The division gave them the kit. Uh, I've had them, one was turned into a tool car with a boom, um, kind of like the old Ma and Pa X2, I think it is. Uh, somebody else made a camp car out of it. Other guys have made grain cars. Uh, and people then share and two of the members actually brought slides and talked about how they built it and why they, they made their choice. And then that inspired others who hadn't built to go on and then work on it. So we, we try different things. We are talking about um, changing up our um, meetings a little bit. We've been pretty much two clinics and two uh, tours for a couple of years now. And we're thinking of... Um, the discussion is ongoing. No decision has been made because I like to listen to what the members have to say and get feedback. We may go to two, one longer clinic and one shorter one and then have a, a, a show and tell time afterwards or a share time. And like they do at some of the RPM meets. It's not originally my idea. That was uh, suggested by Eric Hansman of the, uh, um, who does the, a lot of the RPM coordination and also does his own resin car um, works type of, uh, has that page for resin car works. So um but it's do an you idea. Do, we do you do contests at those um, at those formal contests, or how does those manage? Uh, up to now, we've had um, everybody bring um, those who bring their cars. They put them out for a popular vote, and the award goes to whoever gets the popular vote. Uh, we have found that by tying the voting um, to the door prizes, you can't pick up a free door prize if you don't look at the models and then decide which one you like the most to, you know, that tends to encourage some. We have had a falling off lately of, uh, of participation in that. And so that's one of the reasons we're trying now to um, come up with a new way of, of approaching that to get more people back involved. We had a lot of participation at first and it's kind of slowed down. Some of that may just be COVID. Some of it may be people's reluctance. Um, some of our modelers that were more active aren't as active as they used to be in, in modeling uh, for various health reasons. So. so so, like AP evaluations typically then don't happen at those events. They're just more of a show and tell and popular vote versus right. having the kind of real AP evaluations and AP level points and that kind of things. We have the AP stuff usually is done after the meet. Um, we invite members if um, to stand around and watch and learn from the AP evaluation. We've had talks about how the AP evaluation is done. We did have a clinic on that where somebody took a model apart and talked about, we had one of our MMRs um, who's now um, not as active as he used to be, had a Lionel, um, he was all tin plate. And he actually made, made there is an, NM, an NMRA spec for uh, tin plate as far as uh, what you have to meet to become a, um, meet the MMR criteria for the various AP things. And he, wa he went through it. Um, but we've, um, yeah, we try to encourage people to do that more afterwards instead of doing it in the middle of the meeting because uh, it tends to, it's a little hard for people to get that close with that delicate many cases of a model to get the visual they need to understand. So we tend to ask people to do that like hey, one or two people. I, I think it's kind of interesting by taking an active decision to keep the contest kind of and that away from AP evaluations 
I think you kind of reinforced that point you made earlier that the AP program is not about bragging about who won the contest. It's about mm -hmm. really the evaluation of your own skills. So that's actually an interesting thought also, I think, to, to kind of uh, feed. Um, Dan Cohen asked, um, does your division have a YouTube channel? Do you capture content on YouTube or how do you do, do you do that or? Um, I've had a request to broadcast and, and content and do that. I think there's one clinic that is currently up on the uh, railtailsva.com site. Um, that was, that's the local hobby shop. And they took, we had a guy who was doing recording who was not doing anymore. So I don't really have that. I'm looking for a volunteer on that. And people keep asking, but I'm like, I can't stand up front and run the show, run the show at the same time I'm taping it. So I've, right. I've kind of tried to get that point across. I need a volunteer. So I'm still kind of waiting for someone to kind of step forward. I have an idea or two and I've kind of hinted at some people, but, um, we'll wait and see. <laughs> Well, then kind of that last question, you know, how do you find volunteers? Um, I mean, how, what do you, you know, you, you sounds like you got some good success getting them. What are some of the other things you've done to get volunteers? Well, besides putting out the word and I also have, there's a couple people in the division who I ask, you know, how to put it. I know some people relatively well. And I know what their skill set is. I mean, uh, up until a recent health out. One of our guys was an excellent photographer, um, been published in some of the magazines as far as uh, prototypes um, shots, and he would be our re resident film guy. So um, we put out the word he was unable for health reasons to attend the last one. One of the guys, his grandson came and did a phenomenal job uh, at taking photographs at our last meet, which will show up in, I think, the new um, magazine. It'll be out, I think, middle part of this month. Um, so um, we just kind of, you ask around and then you start buttonholing and there are a couple of people in a, you know, I try, I have four or five people I can ask, you know, somebody who does this and of the between 30 and 50 active members that we have in the division, plus the, you know, the people who are, I, I call regular visitors, uh, we encourage, uh, because we have so many people in the Northern Virginia area, it's so traffic congested, the same with, uh, the Tidewater area of Virginia, many of the members live at their outskirts actually find it easier to come to our meetings and I encourage them. I mean, they're NMRA members. They want to be active. They can't hold office, but if they want to help with things, do with things. Uh, one of the other things we've done recently is the last two years or a couple years, COVID being a problem in the middle, we have a joint uh, meeting with our uh, sister division to the North, the Potomac division. And it's become kind of a, what we call a, it's becoming a mini con. We're trying to get two other divisions to come in and, and really, um, do it. We found kind of a central point at a church that's willing to, um, but they'll give us free use of their facility, which is fairly large, uh, if we take a donation up for some um, cause that they have. Two years ago, three years ago, I guess, skip for COVID, it was uh, feeding kids at Christmas, buying food for families that didn't have food. Um, they Last year, I think it was um, when I was laid up with a knee, knee surgery, they, I think, did it with... Um, uh, some youth program they were working with. So they, they have a different thing and they ask members to donate and we raise a couple hundred dollars easily every year, every time we do this. So that's kind of also a good thing to do. We usually do that in November. And I think that's also scheduled for this November. That's another uh, thing that's gotten people uh, very interested because um, it allows us to, there are a lot of uh, well-known modelers up in that area in the, in uh, the Potomac Division, um, Bernie Kapinski, Marty McGurk, and I could run Paul Dulcus. There's a whole slew of them that people will know the names of, and we can usually get one of them to show up for a clinic. So um, that also <laughs> helps encourage people because it opens them up. Um, listening to Paul Dulcus talk about how to photograph a model railroad is like, why didn't I think of that? It's just like one of those right after another. It's just like a constant stream of things that, oh, I should have thought about doing that before. And you just, you sit there and go, oh, that's great. Um, now I understand things. Um, so well, that, that brings us to a question from the audience, the picture behind you, what's your, what's the story on your picture behind you, your, your background? Oh, I, uh, cribbed that off of, uh, there's a fellow who's been on one of the, uh, Colorado narrow gauge, um, always had an interest in that first basement size layout I ever saw was an SM three layout in the late sixties, early seventies, um, Denver Rio Grande RGS, and I've always had a love. And I just, this guy's been colorizing these old photos that they've been finding in the Denver Public Library and other places. And so I've just been 
it, he posts them on Facebook and I just save every one I find and I rotate my backgrounds around with those photos because you know normally you get this black and white that looks like nothing and now you've got this color photo and it really does it just jumps out at you because it's like wow and I, I just sit there and when I'm sitting here listening I got kind of an inspiration because I see okay you've got an oil or kerosene headlight there and you've got something on the stack and I just kind of find little things you've got white flags out which means it's an extra of some sort um, so you just run down a list of things that you're trying to you know, it just gives you some ideas to think about, but uh, it also was the fact of the color being just something different that I'm not normally thinking of green with that part of Colorado, because you normally think of it's just desert and it isn't always that way. It's just a reminder. So, so, so one last question, and, and you kind sure. of brought this up. You said that there's, you know, a 10 to one ratio of model railroaders to NMRA members. You know, one of the things that brought, brings up, and I think we're all dealing with this is, um, you know, national recruiting is great, but it has a very limited impact. Are there things you're doing locally to reach out to those modelers that are not NMRA members and have them see the value being local um, to be a member? Um, I think as people are coming out of their shell, I've got a um, one fellow who's now um, working with national on um, doing more of the social media. I've We started a Facebook page. We you know, we had hoped to start a YouTube um, broadcast, but we haven't yet. And he's starting to put more in and post more. So I think we're, we're doing that. We've recruited with some of the clubs. We've yet to, um, I see two demographics to look at for our division. One is the 30, 40 something um, person who wants to get back, mostly male, but not exclusively. Uh, we have one husband wife team. We actually have two husband wife teams, the tag team they're um, modeling. Um, one who's in the division, one who isn't. Um, but um, and then the retiree crowd that we, like I said, we have a large demographic moving out of the Northeast down here and it's trying to tap into them. The local hobby shop works fairly well. The one in Charlottesville, uh, he's real good about referring people to us and uh, telling people about our meets. So, and posting about it. Um, Sounds good. So that's, that's how we, we kind of get the word out. We're still looking for the, the magic bullet and there isn't one. I think it's just going to be hard work. So. Um, a- absolutely. Uh, well, Philip, wanted to take a moment and really thank you for, for taking the time and talking to us. It's great because every time we have one of these, there's a, an idea that comes up. Sometimes things that people do, they don't really think about. And I think the idea of, like you said, about the uh, separating the contest from the AP to just make it clear that it's not a, about a, I did better than you. It's really about honing your own skills. I think that was a great idea. So anyway, thank you, thank you very much. Really appreciate the time and, uh, Look forward to uh, having further conversations with other folks uh, about NMRA and local divisions and clubs. So thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Back to you, Jim. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming tonight and and being with uh, Phil on his segment. Uh, I was really impressed with the club that you mentioned in Charlottesville. I talked to the manager, uh, Nathan, today at at, uh, Rail Tales in uh, Charlottesville, and he couldn't have been nicer. I mean, it's... uh, I've invited, uh, I've invited his uh, owner, uh, I think Brett Jones is the owner, uh, to be on our show in the future uh, because I, I'm really interested in trying to promote the local hobby shops as we are trying to promote the local clubs and, and NMRA divisions. And for you all in the division to be working as close as you seem to be with that club in Charlottesville, I, I think that's really uh, good news, both for the division and for that for that uh, hobby shop. Uh, 